Daniel Reed gave another step in the direction of the amphitheater. It still amazed him that he was not dead. After all, Father Michael did kill him back in the crypt hidden in the forest. He also brought him back to life, eternally. Daniel was made into a vampire, a Nosferatu as Father Michael explained. They were both members of House Strix, the House of the Eagle, a family of hedonists and nihilists. He also learned that there were other houses or families but still had not met any members outside his own. Father Michael stood beside him very proud of himself. He explained to Daniel that it was a great honor to be brought into the blood and that it takes a lot of effort to secure authorization from the King's Council. Unlike Daniel would have imagined, Nosferatu also had laws, and it seemed that turning a mortal into one without permission was a severe crime that could end with the direst of consequences. Luckily for both of them, Father Michael had an opening with a member of the council that also belonged to the House Strix, a man named Pierre Dupont. He made sure that everything would have been done the proper way. Now, as it stands, Daniel Reed would be introduced to the council and to Nosferatu society. The priest was also quick to point out that destroying a Nosferatu was a serious crime that brought swift destruction upon the offender. Daniel should dismiss any ideas of revenge or he would face the wrath of the king's council, a group made up by the most powerful Nosferatu in the city, responsible for upholding the king's law and peace. As the moon rose, Daniel sighed, making Father Michael chuckle. The priest reminded him that he had no reason to since he was dead, but it was good practice to do it in front of mortals. Nosferatu were bound by the theater, the act of never revealing to mortals their true nature. Daniel felt nervous and the fact that his body did not respond as such bothered him. He did not feel heart palpitations and did not produce sweat as he would if he was still alive. As he realized this, Father Michael called for his attention. They entered the Mark Anthony Amphitheater and Father Michael shook a lot of hands as he explained their house was the most numerous in the city. Many Nosferatu congratulated Father Michael for his new progeny, yet Daniel could see that many of them were openly jealous to the point of sarcasm. They also extended their congratulations to Daniel and welcomed him. Some offered him the advice of picking his friends and enemies cautiously in the future. A fat and short man of Italian descent named Don Vittorio approached Father Michael kissing the vampire on both cheeks. He was a member of House Leviathan, the House of the Sea Serpent. As Father Michael explained, they were allies of their own house. Michael, congratulations on getting rights to blood. He seems like a promising one. Don Vittorio approached Daniel, also giving him a kiss on both cheeks, and gave him a wad of cash as a welcoming gift. Make your father proud, my boy. A brunette woman wearing a black suit, named Jennifer, introduced herself as the familiar of a Nosferatu of House Dracul, the House of the Dragon. Mr. Holloway sends his best wishes. Nonetheless, he wants to remind you of how lucky you were to get this authorization. You should be more careful from now on, because he will not be as forgiving the next time. Father Michael explained that Jennifer was a familiar, a mortal who does the bidding of a Nosferatu during the day. Even though she has not been brought to the blood, familiars of vampires such as Holloway, a member of the King's Council, yielded political power that should not be underestimated. Daniel's attention was grabbed by the conversation of a horrific Nosferatu of House Orlok, the House of the Bat. He was telling a dreadful tale to others around him in the hopes of rallying support to his cause. There is a war in the sewers. Numerous monsters crawl under the city and devour everything they encounter. I myself was lucky to have survived my last encounter with them. It was thanks to a mortal who carried me to safety before I fed on his blood. We do not know what these monsters are how long they're going to stay only underground. Another Nosferatu caught his attention, an eerie old farmer who walked around barefoot. He was from House Volkos, the House of the Wolf, and talked about a project that has been problematic for many of the other members of his house. I finally found the help I needed to keep the farm afloat. With all the hard work we have been doing for Mud and the Rancher, it was hard for the staff to remain motivated. Keeping them scared on their toes did solve the problem though and they can also be used as refreshments. Later, Father Michael introduced Daniel to a young woman nicknamed Blood Mary. Hey there, little cousin. If you ever need blood in an emergency, give me a call. I can take care of it for a price. You are welcome to give us a visit at my nightclub, The Rapture. After she left, the priest explained that although they were from the same house, she was antagonizing Dupont for the leadership of their family, and she was not the only one. The house was divided into three branches struggling for power, 
even though Dupont had a grip on most of the family. In another group, Daniel heard about a haunted house in the outskirts of the city, where a child vampire made her home. Apparently, she was from the house Morrigan, the house of the Raven. They have been hunted by all other houses in the last century. There are only two members left in the King's Court, and as legend has it, they are all cursed. Father Michael pointed discreetly to another group and told him they were the House Ashikari, the House of the Owl, an order of secretive and mysterious magicians. They have brought a new member into the blood, and Dupont used it as leverage to guarantee Daniel's authorization. Hendrik, the sire, was teaching Julio the child in the same manner as themselves. Finally, a mortal pale man requested Daniel to accompany him, and Father Michael told Daniel to oblige him. It was part of the process. The detective was taken into a room where he waited alongside a fellow who was very disturbed. Daniel took a glance at the man and realized he was in anguish, but before he could ask any questions the pale man came back and took them to the backstage of the amphitheater. From there he could see the whole place filled with vampires in the audience, and on top of the stage there were six Louis XV chairs, and in the middle a throne made of skulls. The man started to get more anxious, and he started to cry bloody tears. Daniel was getting apprehensive he could not fathom what was happening to the man. A vampire wearing regal garb took the stage and announced the name of the members of the council, and one by one they took their seats in the chairs. Caroline Graves from House Leviathan, Pierre Dupont from House Strix, the rancher from House Volkos, Adrian Van Arden from House Ashkari, Jacob Holloway from House Dracul, Spectre from House Orlok. But the skull throne remained empty. It all ran like a town meeting, until they announced the council had to judge a crime. The pale man came and took the crying man with him. Jacob Holloway salivated as he declared the man should be destroyed for being turned without authorization. He was set ablaze by Van Arden, with some kind of sorcery and turned to ash. The audience clapped and cheered, but Daniel saw one sad vampire in their midst. He felt sorry for him, but did not know why. Daniel was called after the punishment, but was received with a lot less enthusiasm. He was asked to swear fealty to the king's council and abide by their laws, or he would share the fate of the ashes scattered on the ground. In that moment, he realized to his horror that maybe he would be better off dead. In the shadows, he noticed an unassuming man wearing a black suit, smiling, red eyes gleaming with malice, and realized the shadows in this world were a lot deeper than he expected. 